a company of forward thinkers with more than 55,000 employees around the globe and products in 58 customer countries, Raytheon has established itself as a trusted partner. From detection to action, we give our customers a decisive advantage. Customer-driven, technology-powered, Raytheon, revolutionizing defense capabilities. Hello and welcome to the Emerging Tech Horizons podcast. I'm Jacob Wynn, an Associate Research Fellow at NDI Emerging Technologies Institute. Today's episode focuses on DOD and defense industry engagement with minority-serving institutions, or MSIs. This category of universities includes historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic-serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and Asian American and Pacific Islander-serving institutions. My guest today is one of our very own associate research fellows, Wilson Miles, who just published a workshop report on DOD and defense industrial base engagement with MSIs. You can find the paper on ETI's website, www.emergingtechnologiesinstitute.org. Please join me in welcoming Wilson to today's podcast. So Wilson, could you tell us a bit about your background and how you came to ETI and why you are focused on defense technologies? Yeah, so I've been with ETI for about a year and a half now. Um, and prior to this, I was a grad student at American University, uh, their School of International Service. I was getting my master's in U.S. foreign policy and national security with a concentration on national security. And uh, I went to grad school right after undergrad. I went to Linfield University. I studied international relations. Um, when I came to D.C., I wasn't like a lot of other students. I didn't have a particular focus that I was super, you know, um, concentrated on. And uh, it was about my second to last semester. I took a technology and national security course and just fell in love with it. And I've essentially been on that track since. And so right after grad school, um, I got an internship with the Hudson Institute. Um, and then after that, got my job at ETI as an associate research fellow. And then since I started here, I've been working on projects like our hypersonic supply chain report, Currently, our directed energy supply chain report. I just wrapped up this uh, minority serving institution workshop paper. Um, and, you know, my interest in defense technologies is not really something that I think I can articulate super well, but it's just something that I'm very, very passionate about. I just, I feel it. Um, and, you know, this position at ETI has just been, um, you know, a dream come true. So. Fantastic. And the paper that you're mm -hmm. releasing through ETI is based on a workshop that was held recently. Could you tell us a bit more about the workshop? Yeah, so um, we held a workshop with the Office of the Chief Scientist of the Air Force Office and NDIA Science and Engineering Technology Division um, in San Antonio, Texas, after the S&T Division's uh, you know, annual uh, symposium. And this really followed an event that we did uh, also with the Office of the Chief Scientist of the Air Force Office last fall, which focused on uh, really how can DOD better work with um, historically black colleges and universities. Um, we've also held, um, our, our, our boss, Dr. Arun Serafin, um, invited uh, Ms. Evelyn Kent uh, from DOD, who's their HBCU and MI uh, uh, director on this podcast. And so really this is kind of that next step um, in terms of holding an in-person event um, and so uh, we looped in the, the, uh, the s and division um, and then we started doing a bunch of outreach and we held that workshop um, on the University of Texas San Antonio's campus uh, in this past May. Um, and we invited a, uh, about 20 to 25 individuals who were from the Air Force uh, industry and academia, both from four years and two years. Uh, really looking at some of these barriers and incentives for uh, STEM students from minority serving institutions. Great, fantastic. And based on what you heard, why do you think that the Air Force and the defense industrial base are interested in engagement with MSIs? Yeah, well, so, um, uh, you know, there's an interesting uh, stat here. So altogether, two and four year MSIs represent about 30% of all uh, U.S. undergraduates in the um, higher education system. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity there and, and, uh, the air force is looking to, um, address some of the STEM workforce shortages that, uh, you know, is facing them, but, you know, across the DOD, across the military services, across industry. 
and uh, there's a sense uh, for tapping into some uh, underrepresented groups in the United States. And uh, MSIs are particularly unique because they're a rich source of U.S. citizens uh, when compared to, you know, some of these bigger R1 universities. Um, you know, just kind of a quick anecdote, during my during our outreach for the Director of Energy Supply Chain Report, uh, I was talking with a, um, a dean of engineering, and he said uh, that, who was uh, a dean at an HSI, and he said that um, HSI, or students at HSIs typically tend to have higher retention in mm -hmm. the defense industrial base. And so there's a recognition that these students provide a lot of value to DOD and the defense industrial base. Definitely. And what were some of your key takeaways from the paper? Yeah, so uh, one of the first key takeaways, I would say, was there was a consensus into that there's a lack of a culturally sensitive messaging campaign surrounding uh, recruitment and talent development for STEM students from minority serving institutions. And there's been a lot of um, efforts trying to get at this problem, but it seems that there's a kind of an incoherence to those efforts from DOD and the defense industrial base as it relates to DOD's critical sure. technology areas. And when we get at the recruitment part of that, uh, there were a number of participants who said that uh, that the messaging campaign needs to consider more uh, regarding the parents. There was a big emphasis on the parents for some of these students. And, you know, a lot of um, um, students from Hispanic families, you know, they're oftentimes the first people in their family to go to college. Sure. And then they're the first uh, first people in their families to get to go get a graduate degree. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really new experience for them. And navigating the pathways to DOD and the defense and industrial base can be tricky. Um, and so this kind of leads into another key part of this, which is um, needing to do some of this recruitment and messaging in their native language. And so we had one participant from uh, who represented a community college say that he had saw a lot of success when he did or when he was interacting with some of these students and putting on workshops in their native language. And so there was a, there was a higher response rate. There were, um, the feedback was more positive because the students felt comfortable sure. uh, speaking and articulating their needs in their native language. Um, so the second, the second key finding sure. was that there was, uh, there's an opportunity to leverage more talent from vocational schools and community colleges. Um, uh, it's like 30% of all uh, two-year community colleges are MSIs. Um, and so, you know, when we think about transitioning some of these critical technologies from the lab to manufacture them at scale, there's a huge uh, need for some of that, you know, support workforce. And uh, a lot of the working group, working group participants mentioned that a lot of the, the, the focus at the at the strategic level is on PhDs. And so, you know, when we start to think about transitioning, we need to think about that support workforce. And oftentimes that two year degree holder is uh, the type of individual that is going to look for some of those positions, which is perfect. And so there's a ripe opportunity to kind of bridge that gap. Sure. Uh, the, uh, the third takeaway was that, and this isn't really surprising, is that there's a lot of competition with the non-defense commercial market. Definitely. Right? Uh, a lot of these jobs are, you know, higher paying, and you also don't have to deal with the security clearance process. And that's enticing to a lot of students who aren't exactly familiar with what that process actually entails. And then the last takeaway that I'll mention <clears throat> is that um, there are some barriers that stem from contract language. And so this can take it the form like some of these contracts require uh, the contractor to hire four-year degrees, whereas possibly that position might be able to be fulfilled with a two-year degree. Yep. And so there were folks from industry who were thinking about different ways to satisfy a work requirement through different vocational schools, just basically through different degrees. And so that was one barrier. And then also, uh, some of these contracts require 
that the um, that they, the the performer uh, conducts that contract in a certain distance within a certain distance of the place of performance. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That essentially means that uh, if there's a, a place of performance that is away from a student, that student is not eligible to participate in an internship. Um, in the summer, you know, you can't exactly pay for, uh, you know, you know, housing, living. Um, and so it adds complications to first generation American families. Um, and so those are some of the key takeaways. Um, there are more on the paper. Absolutely. Thank you. And what are some of the action steps that you had laid out in the paper for DOD and industry to take? Yeah, so there, so there are a few. Um, my personal favorite is that the defense industrial base can sponsor participation in different defense conferences and events uh, for uh, faculty and students from minority serving institutions. And why that's important, um, one, it can be done in the near term. This is a very easy uh, thing that companies can do to bring more students and faculty in from MSIs. And these events are important because you can do networking and you can find the jobs. And oftentimes that lack of access and that is, is really, really important. Definitely. Um, and it's, it's, it is a barrier. And so that's one thing, um, you know, where you see fit, you can adjust the contract language so that it incorporates more flexibility into the contract. So this can um, influence how companies approach hiring. Um, you know, companies want to approach hiring for essentially, you know, getting contracts and positioning themselves in a way that's most beneficial for them to get that contract mm -hmm. and execute that pro project. So finding ways to be flexible um, is, is another area. Another thing that the defense industrial base can do is create an affinity group. And an affinity group is essentially a, uh, a group that is binded by a particular interest. So in this case, it would be how can companies in the defense industrial base find ways to uh, identify, reduce, and eliminate barriers uh, for STEM students from MSIs. Um, and uh, the final thing that is also extremely important is that DOD should create a working group that consists of um, individuals from the services and across agencies, as well as uh, uh, members from the defense industrial base to continue the conversation. You know, this is, this is, uh, this is going to require a lot more work, more funding. Um, and so we need to continue the conversation. And in our experience, the working group that we put together in San Antonio was a good conversation starter. Um, the job's not done. And so uh, uh, continuing that conversation in the form of a working group that consists of companies from big, you know, the big primes to all the way down to small businesses across DOD coming together to talk about some of these issues and finding ways to eliminate those barriers um, and provide incentives for those students to come work on defense projects um, is really, really important. Absolutely. Thank you. And in terms of us at ETI, what are the next steps for working on this issue? Yeah. So, um, you know, at ETI, we're very open to uh, continuing this work. And so we would really just encourage people um, and organizations from NDI's membership base and, and non-membership base to reach out and see how we can partner um, and, you know, perhaps put out a webinar or write a report um, and so that's just one quick thing that I would that I would add to that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of the uh, Emerging Tech Horizons podcast. Uh, if you enjoyed the podcast, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with all of our latest content. And please visit our website to see our upcoming products. That includes a full agenda of our upcoming Tech 101s, webinars, short courses, and reports that we have planned for the rest of the fall. And I'd like to thank our producers, Daniel Park and Melanie Yu.